So I all I know is there's that spreadsheet that lists the speakers who are around uh, uh, and has their email addresses. So uh, yeah, my, yeah. My, my my default thing was to just send an email address uh, to them. Yeah. Or right. or I could send email to all the speakers and ask uh, who wants to. Uh, or I can just yeah, hang out okay, after this uh, and attract people with my <laughs> magnetic personality. <laughs> <laughs> I will use my uh, <coughs> my arm twisting abilities. Shall we get started? Yes. Okay, we'll give you an hour. Or so. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. So <coughs> we were discussing this projection embedding in the DMFT. So uh, now <coughs> let me give you uh, an overview of what we decide, what we discussed. So in, in the standard theory, in order to determine the electron electron correlation potential, we p map each point in 3D space to an electron gas problem. And in DMFT, what we do is we map own the problem of an ion into the problem of quantum impurity. So less restrictive than in, uh, than, than, than in standard theory. And the trick is only done to get the exchange correlation uh, potential or the sample energy, not uh, to approximate Dyson equation or approximate kinetic energy or any of those terms. Okay, so now uh, correlations are very local in, in, in large D. One can prove that, of course, when uh, uh, dimension goes to infinity or connectivity goes to infinity, then um, dynamical mean field theory is exact, just like any Weiss mean field theory. Now, however, <clears throat> the question is, how good is this approximation in uh, finite dimensions? Uh, so, well, zero D. The H2 molecule is a standard <clears throat> problem of strong correlations. So H2 molecule, does it, does it do well or not? How, how well or how, how badly does it fail? Well, in order to solve the H2 molecule, uh, uh, one has to first define the DMFT projector because <clears throat> we know that if we, if we choose a bad projector, then, uh, well, we're not going to get good results. We need to choose a good projector. 
uh, we need to define local green, what local greens function is. Now, <clears throat> there are, of course, various ways to do DMFT. It's very flexible. So we could do DMFT with two site approximations. So we include uh, uh, self energy on the site and self energy between the two sites. But that would give you more or less the exact solution. So we know that. You, you, we don't want to do that. What, to, what we want to do is we want to make self energy only local. So in other words, this is going to be just a single orbital problem. Okay? So it's going to be one orbital on that site, one orbital on that site, no inter intersite self energy. Okay? The question is, how good does it work? Okay? So uh, we first defined the projector, and uh, we decided to define projector through the exact solution of H2 plus system. H2 plus is actually exactly solvable because you get just one uh, electron, isn't it? And we get something which is called one sigma g and one sigma u function. And then we can, we can construct the left and the right. Uh, 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 functional. So this, this phi left is something that is centered uh, a lot on the left hand side. Phi right is something that's centered on the right hand side. Solution of uh, H2 plus, isn't it? So in the limit, when we go for a larger separation, we are just going to get uh, uh, 1s orbital of the hydrogen. If you put together, we are going to get the solution of, uh, uh, of the H2 plus problem. Okay? And we use this for a projector. So we project to the left, we project to the right, <coughs> and we take into account only local terms on the left, local terms on the right, no cross terms. So how does it work? Well, there are, of course, several ways we can, we can do that. Uh, one way is to do it with Hartree-Fock plus DMFT. So what does it mean, Hartree-Fock plus DMFT? Well, we are going to treat phi as we will, we will, of course, treat the Hartree term exactly, because Hartree term is very, very, very large. You never want to approximate that, not even in DFT. Isn't it? Then <clears throat> for the molecules, actually, it turns out the exchange is actually very large. It's a good idea to treat it exactly, which is very cheap. No big deal. And then the rest is being approximated with the DMFT. So we add here all the local graphs. The local means local to the left, to the left side, to the left atom, local to the right atom. And then we also need to subtract the double counted term. And the nice thing is that here we know exactly what is being double counted. Okay? So what's being double counted? Well, this is exact heart return, isn't it? Heart return. Looks like this. Rho of R, rho of R prime, rho of R minus prime. Okay? So in DMFT, the heart return actually has this form. Rho local, rho local divided by R minus R prime. That's how it looks like. Okay? We could write it in a discrete basis, but that's exactly the form that it's going to look like. Okay? Now the exchange here, in the exact exchange has this form. Okay? Similar to Hartree, but with RR prime. And then the exchange in DMFT actually has this form. So we see that you notice that in DMFT, all the terms look just like in the, the exact functional, except that all the rows and all the greens functions have to be replaced by the local counterparts. Okay? That's all. And now, uh, uh, so we know what we need to subtract, these, these two functionals. We can also do the, the LDA plus DMFT, where we also add the correlations of LDA, and then we need to subtract the local correlations, uh, uh, the, 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 the local correlations. Where we, 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 here we write the LDA functional, and then everywhere where the rho appeared in the LDA functional, we replace it with rho local, and that's the DMFT approximation for the LDA functional. Okay? DMFT approximation for the LDA, LDA functional, and that has to be subtracted. Okay? So now we have a, a reasonable approximation, and let's see how it looks like in the H2 molecule. So uh, you see that there is a region here. Uh, well, first, in the important point is that when distance goes to infinity, we recover the exact solution in the sense that we get uh, H, uh, H molecule. Now, it turns out that's very hard for most of theories. For example, GW fails pretty badly. Uh, Hartree-Fock, LDA fails, Hartree-Fock fails. None of them can get this uh, atomic limit. That's a well-known problem, well-known problem of all the standard approaches. Okay? Now, in DMFT, this, of course, works out because uh, it's a trivial statement. DMFT treats the atom exactly. So, of course, when you, when you move to infinite separation, you're going to get exact solution. We know that. Uh, now, there is, a, there is a region here where the molecule breaks. That's the breaking point where the molecule breaks. Now, it turns out that this is not so good. We need cluster corrections. Uh, why? Because we are doing infinite dimensional approximation, and it turns out we get something like a mode transition. We actually get a jump here. Okay? We get something like a mode transition, which is not good in the molecule. In the molecule, there is no mode transition. Okay? So there, are, there is a breaking point in which this approximation fails. So that's the answer to the question before we had, uh, how, does it, how well does it work in, uh, in problems where, which, which have bonds? Okay? Now, however, if you're interested uh, in this close to equilibrium, okay, that's what you get. Now, 
GW curve here is, is down here. It's very hard to see, but GW curve is, curve is down here, okay? So GW is way worse than any of these approximations, okay? Uh, LDA is here. Hard to is here. So they're all worse, of course, much worse. Now, uh, the DMFT, if you zoom in, this is hard to plus DMFT, LDA plus DMFT, and it's exact. So it turns out that close to equilibrium, actually, this approximation is pretty good. It's pretty good. So, and, and also, for example, it corrects the spectra of the LDA. So this, this is the uh, spectra, the, 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 uh, uh, the first level in LDA. This is the exact one, and this is the DMFT. So it definitely improves both spectra, and it makes uh, the energy, uh, of course, way better. You can also see that if you do the LDA, it turns out that correlation energy actually is decreasing with the separation. So if you go further away, uh, if, you, if you put uh, atoms very far apart, it turns out that LDA correlation energy actually is smaller. Okay? But when you do DMFT, you clearly see that this grows with the, with the distance. So it, it gives you gives you this correct trend. So in other words, even from the worst case scenario, which is the zero dimension, which this is not supposed to work, supposed to work in infinite dimensions, it, it looks reasonable. So uh, we expect, of course, that in 3D, this is going to be way better. Yes? I'm a little confused. Uh, when you do this uh, thing, your low orbital is just an S orbital. No, no. Actually, it turns out S orbit is not so great. You know why? Because when you put two S orbitals together, they overlap a lot. And then you need to re-ortho re normalize and so right. on. So the projector is not so good. Right. Yeah, so no, what, what we do here is slightly more intelligent. As I said here, we, dis we, we write this in terms of H2 plus problem. This H2 plus problem can be solved exactly. Okay? And then you, you, you write uh, in terms of even and odd combination of one sigma G and one sigma U. Okay? Of the H2 plus. In the presence of the RT or from the other. Uh, of the other ion, yeah. So, so you, you, have, you have two, um, uh, two nucleus and one electron. Uh -huh. That's exactly solvable. So that's what called, what's called H2+. So, so they are not spherical. They are kind of deformed when you split them apart. They are not really circular. They're spherical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah, they're deformed, yes. H2+. I mean, here they're, they're shown, you see? That's how it looks like. And that's how it looks like in real space, the function of R. Yes, these are projectors. Yes. Wait, what is sigma D plus U? Sorry? Uh huh. What is the difference? One sigma G, one sigma U. So this is the ground state for the H2 plus, and one sigma U is the first excited state. Okay. And then on the other side, uh, there's uh, the next slide. This one. So one is, th this is, this is yeah, minus and plus. On oh, the next slide. Ah, here. Okay, so what we do here at DMT, you just look at the spectral function. So we look at the spectral function. The spectral function is supposed to know what is the excitation when you, when you, sub when you take out one electron or you add another electron. Okay? So that, that's what the spectral function is supposed to measure, isn't it? And in DMT, we calculate the spectral function. Of course, in other methods, we are just looking at the, at the position of this, uh, the, the energy of that state, where you add an electron or you remove an electron, isn't it? Uh, it, this, this is with DMFT and this is the exact, so it's reasonable, much better than DFT, yes? So, so for this particular problem, it's this molecule, the exact spectral function should just be a bunch of delta functions. Correct. Correct. It's this delta function here and that delta function here. So the, but the, the, uh, the fact that you have width to your spectral function, what, what is the source in the approximation that gives that? <coughs> Let, let, let's just give you delta functions. Correct. Right. Correct. Uh, th th that's an excellent question. I mean, uh, it's an excellent question. Should the D is the DMFT, uh, should the DM well, in practice, this is done with so-called maximum entropy. So in other words, you solve the, you solve the DMFT approximation, you do an so, so continuation. Given that you know, no. you know your, your priors that you put, like you mm -hmm. think about, about maximum entropy as, mm -hmm. as, as some Bayesian method where you have mm -hmm. some priors. Yes. So the priors you're putting in are the ones that are appropriate for a Yeah. So what you do here is you, we put here just a constant, and it, it, that's what, you, what it gives you out. Just the constant, no, no, no knowledge before. You expect to get better results if instead you you try to reconstruct the spectrum, assuming that it was 
was just there's the function of, of some finite number of delta <coughs> functions and the positions of those yeah. delta functions, their heights were the yeah. same parameters. I, I guess you could get better, yeah. Yeah, I think you could get better, actually. Why yeah. they delta functions? It's a finite system. It's a, no, the finite system still has a bunch of delta functions. They're, they're, they're ex exact solutions of your many body problem. They're just there is bunch no of, continuum. There's no continuum, yeah. I mean, the reason we have continuum is because of, uh, uh, well, we wrote the DMFT approximation. So it's a good question. Is DMFT, at least on, on imaginary axis, it looks just, just like a continuous problem. But in reality, it's not, actually. It's still finite, isn't it? So what could probably do better, yeah? You're being too smart. Yeah, too smart, yeah. <laughs> I'm using machinery for the continuous yeah. system, yeah. Way of doing the yeah, the one could do it, one could do discrete problem, yes. Exactly, exactly. So are you saying that the satellite I see around 15 mm, uh, or actually that's a time unit, uh, is that a result of the... Of DMFT, yeah. ...or analytic continuation, or is it a result of the DMFT of uh, Well, I mean, there is another level here. There are many levels. I mean, the, 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 the H2 molecule has more levels. But you have only one orbital. So, at most, you can get... Well, that, that's not true, because you, you, you're, 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 you're coupled to other orbitals as well. You have lots of orbitals, actually, non-interactive, which, which are treated here in mean field. You have, per site, we have something like 20 orbitals. And the other side, 20 orbitals. And you... you only put one orbital. Interact, one is interacting, but there are 20 extra orbitals in the problem. So here, you, well, without this, if you don't do that, it's going to be a disaster. <laughs> That's what most of the people are doing for H2 molecule. They say, well, it's very, DMFT is very bad. It's because, you see, it's better to treat heart rate and exchange well, which means that you need to have 10 orbitals per site, at least. Okay. Yep. One more question. So how do you get an energy which is below uh, in GW, it's easy to get. GW uh, or uh, if you have a variational, yeah. if you have variational uh, method, then you know that you're not going to get lower energy. But if it's non-variational, you've been writing down functional, but that's not going. That's not. Free, free unfortunately, energy. functionals are not are not necessary variational methods. No. Even the full in GW, is not. it's not guaranteed to be to be above the ground state. No. No. Even though it's now functional. For the printing theory guarantee, though, right? Now, for the printing theory guarantee, yeah. a, 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 a version of this, it's not bounded. Yeah. Unfortunately, no. We don't have variational. <laughs> the Herbie Fox version. Yes. <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> but that's, <laughs> that's the only one here, yes. When you go to higher orders, I mean, it turns out that DMFT is actually about the ground state always, it seems like. But DMFT is not variational, so I, uh, I don't want to claim that DMFT is variational in any way. So it could easily happen that it would go below, easily. But it doesn't in this case. Uh, okay, so uh, now unfortunately in solids we need further approximations. Why? Because, of course, there are many, many uh, uh, degrees of freedom uh, in a solid. And we want to just concentrate on treating well some the degrees of freedom, which actually we can solve with our, our quantum impurity. When the quantum impurity solvers become better and better, we're going to be able to treat more. Now, uh, what do we usually do? Well, um, uh, we write, so, so we write our Green's function in some discrete set of, uh, set of states, RR prime, and then, <clears throat> uh, well, actually, we, we do this only for those states which are reasonably localized, such as D states or F states. Of an, of, uh, on, 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 on traditional metal ions or on uh, F ions. But you don't do that for S electron, okay? Because S electron actually doesn't live in a sphere, doesn't it? It's not a good idea, I want to do that. So now the, the nice thing about this, about, uh, about the DMFT, is that this such localized S uh, state, which is not correlated, is just, um, j it can be integrated out when we do the DMFT problem, okay? can be integrated out. So that's a nice, a nice feature. Now we're going to discuss, discuss this in a problem. Now, unfortunately, there is a problem. Because since we remove some states when we do dynamical mean field theory approximation, so when we, um, when we treat our local degree of freedom, we remove some states, OK? Uh, uh, especially those at higher energies. And we remove those uh, non-local correlations. And therefore, we have our effective U has to be smaller than the bare U. The bare interaction, one or omnus or prime, is just way too big. 
So in DMFT, it turns out the, 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 the effective interaction has to be screened. Okay? And this screening in solids, actually, it's, it's, I would say, is still a big problem. So that's something that I, I think in the next couple of years, I hope we're going to make much bigger progress than that we did up to now. Unfortunately, the screening in solids is relatively poorly understood. Okay? So one can do calculations such as GW or RPA, but <clears throat> there, are, there are several uh, materials where we know that they miserably fail. Okay? So they don't give you a good qu qu quantitative result. They give you reasonable qualitative physics. They don't give you quantitative numbers, which are good enough. So, and nevertheless, the screening in solids is still, I would say, a problem. However, the rest, I think you have a pretty, pretty, pretty good, good handle on it. Now, what do we do uh, with DFT plus DMFT? Now, <clears throat> we, we come to marry the, marry the two together. So, we said that there are many, many itinerant states which are very economically described by DFT or be, with LDA, and we don't want to include them in our DMFT problem. Now, however, there are, there are some orbitals on some sites, Ri, which need to be treated better. And those orbitals are uh, treated here on DMFT, which means that we are summing all diagrams local to that site. Okay? And we need to subtract then the double counting, which we're going to discuss in, in a second. So this double counting here is the DMFT approximation for LDA functional or LDA approximation for a DMFT functional. In both cases, you get the same, the same expression. Okay? And this one is, of course, sum of all skeleton diagrams for most correlated states. And this LDA functional, of course, is the, fun is the local functional for all the degrees of freedom. Okay? All the degrees of freedom. Okay? So that's, that's how you construct the two. Now, <clears throat> now you understand why the functional language was useful. Because we are making an approximation now on the phi functional. Okay? Rather than giving self constant condition and giving the, 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 uh, all the nitty gritties of the method, all you need to do here is write down the approximation for a function, and you also need to see what we need to subtract. Okay? Once you have that, all the rest is math. You, you, you figure out what, are your, um, uh, what is your stationary condition on the functional, and you get the exact, uh, you get the DMFT uh, equations. Now, <clears throat> uh, the quantum impurity solver on DMFT is still well expensive, because we can treat something like five orbitals for transition metal ions, or seven orbitals for lanthanides and actinides, but that's already very expensive. So, unfortunately, we cannot go uh, to, let's say, uh, uh, to a few sites uh, with all d uh, orbitals, because that would require a you know, big impurity problem. Uh, I mean, I think that this in future this is going to improve a lot, because it <clears throat> has, has been tremendous uh, improvements over the last five years or so on these impurity solvers. But nevertheless, we're somewhat limited here. However, there are also a, a, an important virtues of DMFT. Uh, why? Well, because uh, once, we, once we approximate this uh, uh, self-energy with a local approximation, then it scales linearly with the system size. Why? Because if we have uh, three correlated ions, it's just three times more expensive than one correlated ion. If we have a big unit cell with 50 correlated ions, this is 50 times more expensive than having one atom per unit cell. So it, it scales linearly with a number of uh, non-equivalent correlated ions. So in some sense, it's, it's relatively cheap once you accept this local approximation. Okay? But of course, you cannot treat many system, uh, you cannot treat very large system to be interacting. You have to truncate to some important local degrees of freedom. Now, the, 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 the other important thing for that, yes? So as, as a complete code pair of nothing, I, I, I'm not sure I know what you mean, what you mean when you say you can treat five orbitals. Does that mean you can in your cell, there are five orbitals, or that. I mean, what, <laughs> what yes. does that mean? Okay. Yeah. 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 So <clears throat> you see, when I when I wrote, very important. So when I wrote a projector here, that's uh, some time ago, which I hope I should come back. Uh, here, I wrote projector here, isn't that here? Okay. So projector, which which serves to the projector to the local Green's function, and then to embedding of the self energy. Okay. So these indices alpha, beta here are discrete indices. Okay. These are the, the degrees of freedom that you want to treat better. And it turns out that here this alpha and beta can, 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 be, can correspond to five orbitals, for example. That's easy to solve. Because your impurity problem will then, con, uh, then have five orbitals, which means 10, uh, 10 uh, 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 well, what, what does it mean? It's like <clears throat> 10 side Hubbard model. Okay? 
So that's relatively easy to solve, okay? More, it's very, no, actually, five orbit Hubbard model, five side Hubbard model. That's relatively, relatively easy to solve. If you go beyond that, it gets very hard because, well, these are very complicated impurity problems. So it has to do with this discretization here. How many, how many active degrees of freedom you want to treat better? Right. So, beyond so mean I'm, field. I'm trying to describe a, a, a chunk of material that is mm -hmm. 10 to the 23 atoms in it. Correct. Right? And does this, this. mean I am, I am uh, calculating something that involves just one of those atoms? Or no. That means no. I'm, no. I'm calculating something which you know, the, the, yeah. What am I? Yeah, so it's, the, the theory is always in thermodynam thermodynamic limit, uh -huh. just like in DFT here. But what you do here is you take an atom here, you write your active degrees of freedom in some localized basis, phi alpha beta that I ex expressed before. And for example, you describe all the 3D, uh, 3D orbitals, okay? 3D orbitals, which are five, isn't it? Okay, and these 3D orbitals you can treat with your quantum impurity model. So in other words, you describe the dxz, dx, the dxz, dyz, dxy, dx minus y squared, the z square, isn't it? These are the active degrees of freedom you take into account on an atom, on an atom, okay? And that's it. You can't do more. Okay, that's what I meant. Okay. But of course, this is this is reasonable basis for your atom. Very reasonable basis for your atom. Why is this reasonable? Because you see, when you have a 3D 3D uh, material that has cor correlations on a 3D, uh, 3D site, then uh, the, the P orbitals and the, on the same site, of course, and the S orbitals on the same site, are actually pretty far away, okay? So the fact that I'm treating S and P on the same atom with a mean field is actually an excellent approximation. I really need to treat better the 3D orbitals because these are really close to the Fermi level. The, la the last is a Rydberg away. Okay, so in similar in many F systems, you just need to treat the F degrees of freedom. The rest are a rebirth away. So mean field perfect. Okay, so. Correct, correct. No need to be an atomic orbital. Yes, so one can do better if one is uh, wise. Um, now, the, the good thing is that this, <clears throat> this thing can hybridize with an arbitrary number of itinerant states. So what I want to emphasize is that if you have an S, an, an S state, which is delocalized over almost uh, our entire crystal, it's very, very, very delocalized. Now, uh, we treat it in mean field. We don't need to truncate. We don't need to throw it away. We don't need to downfold. There is absolutely no, no reason to downfold and throw away the S orbital. Actually, we can treat it. When we invert the Dyson equation, you remember when I wrote the Dyson equation, it's always in there. All these states are in there. And actually, don't make problem harder. Well, a little harder, but not much harder. You solve the same quantum impurity problem. So we don't need to truncate to some little model. Now, to be more clear here, <clears throat> uh, you, can, you can do this uh, uh, DFT plus DFT in, 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 in two ways. And actually, most of the work which uh, says that it does DFT plus DFT is doing in this direction, which I think is not so good. Now, namely, what, what is easy, conceptually very simple, is to downfold, let's say, the DFT band structure into a set of, instead of hoppings, TIJs, the tight binding model, Hubbard model, okay? You derive the Hubbard model, then you add your local self energy on this Hubbard model and improve, uh, well, do the DMFT on a Hubbard model. But I think that this is actually not so good. Why? Well, because your orbitals in this case are actually not so localized, okay? Now, why do you want very localized orbitals? Well, because when you do dynamical mean field theory, you truncate interaction on, on this site only, okay? And when you truncate this interaction on this site only, you're making an extra, well, in this case, you're making an, an extra approximation because you, ha you treat only interaction on a given site. And if the uh, state is not very localized, it's actually pretty, pretty delocalized because it might be a one-year state, then this is not so great approximation. However, if you take very localized orbitals, very localized orbitals, okay, then their interaction on a given site is very large and the non-local interactions are much smaller. And then DFT approximation is excellent. So therefore, the important point is that <clears throat> if we do projection and embedding directly in real space, then when we, when we 
uh, when we do this Dyson equation here, so they're here writing Dyson equation, isn't it? We don't need to approximate this part. There is no need to approximate nabla square in this step or uh, to, 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 to approximate exchange correlation or external potential in this step, okay? We can solve this exactly. There is absolutely no need to approximate here. The only thing that we are doing, we are, we are now adding a little bit better uh, approximation for sigma DFT to the exchange, to already existing exchange correlation in, in LDA, okay? So we are just adding another term in the Dyson equation and invert the full Dyson equation. That's much better than if we uh, first derive an effective model which actually is not so local and then make a local approximation on it, okay? So um, I prefer this. Now, <clears throat> uh, we introduced the, 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 the combination of DFT and DMFT, so now we can, we can ask your, our, the question, uh, what is the self-consistency condition or how do we solve it? So how, what terms enter? So we are writing uh, in the same way as before, several times, the functional gamma is trace G0 inverse minus G inverse plus trace log minus G. So these are the terms we had before. And then we write the five functional. It's the LDA part, the DMFT part, and subtract the double counting. And now <clears throat> the G0 inverse was already written, so this depends on material, material specific term. Here we need to define the projector, otherwise we, have, we don't have DMFT. So DMFT is defined only once we define the projector. And this is the way we calculate the density. So the, I'm just repeating the equations we learned before. Once we have that, then the rest is the math. So what we do is we ex extremize this functional like, be like before, and we get G0 inverse minus G inverse. And then from the LDA part, we get, this is uh, V hard three plus V exchange correlation, isn't it? Which is static and local. From this part, we get the self-energy of the impurity, isn't that delta phi G local, delta G local is the self-energy of the impurity. And then we get this embedding, and then from the double counting, we get the, the, the double counting potential, which is completely local in space, completely local in time, and also uh, lives in this projected subspace. Okay? So this is what needs to be actually solved. Yes? The, the DC, the double counting uh, index, should be in the five, right, in the last time. Yes, absolutely. It shouldn't be on top of the row. D, DC is missing here, yes. There is a DC in the uh, row. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Absolutely correct. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is absolutely correct. So this DC here, this DC here fits in here in the, in the functional. Sorry. Typing too fast. Um, okay. So uh, then what we proved here is that we have G inverse is G0 inverse minus sigma, where sigma is now expressed in real space. Okay. And sigma RR prime in real space is this is the, the DFT part, which is completely local in space, delta R minus R prime. The DMFT part, which is less local in space in the sense that it has some, some non-locality here, which depends on the projector that we chose. Uh, it can be, uh, it's described by a few orbitals that we can treat better. And then we need to subtract the double counting, uh, which is the DMFT approximation for LDA, approx uh, LDA functional or LDA approximation for the DMFT functional that we come back. Okay, so and all these terms are known. So this term, sigma local, is just the solution of the quantum impurity. Uh, VDC is this derivative here, which we're gonna discuss in a minute. And then the density is just the diagonal part of the Green's function. And the local Green's function is, of course, projected Green's function to this, to this degrees of freedom that we wanna treat. Yes, I believe that's much better. And the reason for this is the following. If you, have a, if you have a hybridized orbital, then actually the orbital is not very local. It has quite a lot of non-locality. And then you have, you have to treat non-local U. There is a lot of non-local U, non-local interaction. Actually, it's quite important because orbitals overlap in real space, isn't it? There's a lot of, lot of non-local U. And therefore, DMFT is not a good approximation. If you could treat non-local interaction. Sorry? If you go to more than one site, 
Well, if you do cluster the MFT, yes, and treat more than one site, yes, of course. I mean, then it doesn't matter, okay? But in single site DMFT, for example, this, this, this is not a good approximation. And you can see it, but if you write single site DMFT approximation for a, work, a very local object, and then you try to rewrite this in terms of, of, of uh, uh, let's say, uh, one year orbitals in a small window, you will see that you generate actually very large non-local terms, okay? Which, of course, you throw away when you do the MFT. You just, sorry, cannot treat them. Okay? So therefore, the, 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 this hybridized orbits are not, are not that good, fortunately, for the MFT purposes. Okay. Um, yeah, well, <clears throat> now, uh, the, the problem with the MFT in some sense is uh, there, there's a good thing. DMFT is very flexible. Okay? You can uh, design it to your, to your needs. You, you have a physical intuition. What are the important degrees of freedom on, on, on a given site? But on the other hand, there are, there are problems because it's not unique. Okay? So if you define different projectors, you're going to get different solution. And that's sometimes a bit worrisome. Now, <clears throat> uh, uh, there, are port there are important requirements for this projector. Before we select what projector is, there are important requirements that I want to go through very quickly. So. Uh, if we, if we embed first and then project, we want to require that this is equal to identity. Why? Because if we take a self-energy that, that, that lives in a small Hilbert space, for example, uh, just 3D, or, 3D uh, orbitals on a given site, okay? you take the self-energy that lives in a small Hilbert space, you embed it into the big Hilbert space, into our prime, okay? and then you project back into the small Hilbert space, you want to get the same object. Okay? Otherwise, you know, things are kind of doesn't, don't, don't look right. Okay? So, so if you embed first and then project, this has to give you identity. Now, however, if you take the full Green's function and you project first, you get truncation of the full object of the Green's function, isn't that? This is truncation of the full object. You truncate, you really approximate. And then when you embed this back into the real space, you don't get the same object. It's a different object now. This, this is what we call G local of R, okay? And this G local of R, of course, is obtained by projection first and then embedding. And this, of course, is not identity, except in a, in a case where you have a Hubbard model, okay? In a Hubbard model, uh, th this projection and embedding is both, uh, uh, the, the whole thing is unitary. So PE is the same as P, EP is the same as identity. But in a general, in a general case, this P times E is not identity, and it actually has a property of the projector. Why? Because, you see, uh, if you apply EP twice, you see that you get EP again. So, because P times E here, it's identity, so it means that we can talk it out. So, the, the, the P times E has the property of a real projector, uh, which means that if you apply this thing on a full Green's function, you get the projected Green's function written in real space, okay? Of course, it has a property of projector. So you, you take an object in real space, project it, and it lives in the same Hilbert space, okay? So these are relatively uh, uh, simple Wait. requirements. Yes? So I see that has the property of the projectors, but, but how do you know what, what is projecting into it? Uh, that depends on what you choose for P. I mean, <clears throat> for example, you choose, uh, you choose 3D orbitals for a given site. So x z, y z, x covenant y square and z square orbital, for example. And uh, I'm going to discuss later on what I think is the best choice. But you have to choose some real space orbitals. Okay? You typically, you expand in terms of YLMs, the like spherical harmonics. Yes? Um, but I mean, you said it's in real space. So mm -hmm. projected into real space? Yes, yes. Everything lives in hidden space. You see, this is RR prime lives in real space. So these, these things have to be defined in real space, some orbitals. So you, you projected it. Sorry, what, then what changed? What, what did you project it? Ah, because you see, this object <clears throat> is, of course, lives everywhere in space. OK? Well, when, once you project, it's, it's relatively localized on a given atom that I chose. Okay. I chose that I'm going to project on atom uh, in the middle of the unit cell, for example. OK? So therefore, this object here, it's non-zero only around this atom. And it's zero outside, or it's very small outside. And you're hoping you've done that in a way so that you're not throwing away too much global Well, <clears throat> this, this truncation here is needed only uh, to define your local correlations. 
That's the only purpose. Just like in DFT, we treat, we take only the charge density. We forget about all the rest, isn't it? The same way here, we take only the Green's function in a very limited region of real space in order to determine the correlation, exchange correlation potential or exchange correlation self energy, okay? Not to, uh, uh, to approximate the full solid, N not at all, because that, that would be disaster to approximate the full solid with only this localized Green's function. This is only to determine a, a reasonable approximation for the self energy. Mm -hmm. I think that this issue is also very Sometimes you only have coded for this, but you actually, even with an orbital, there are also huge spaces in our time that are so uncoded part. That part is also part of reason why this is now one. Sorry, sorry, can you repeat again? The, the, fact, the fact that you lose is one. Yes. Eta P is now one. Mm -hmm. Not only because it's local, it's also because it's a subspace. Of all the orbital that you have in the same Correct, space. correct. Right. That's the, because this, this, or, this, this Hilbert space that you're trying to treat better is much smaller than the original Hilbert space. Much, much smaller, isn't it? Therefore, of course, this cannot be identity because you're basically transforming a quantity from a big Hilbert space into a small Hilbert space. Uh, and therefore, you, 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 uh, the, the, it has to be smaller, isn't it? Right. So I imagine that when you put all the information back to the BFP, mm -hmm. you were somewhere there is a 1 minus P in the formalism that, that keep it. The rest of the information. Right? Of course, of course, that's very important. So the rest of the information is treated in mean field. Yeah. And it's, it's there in the Dyson equation. Okay, now uh, causality of the equations. Actually, it turns out for a long time, people didn't realize that actually most of the approximations unfortunately uh, lead to non-causal equations. And whenever you see non-causality in your, in your equations, this is very bad. It turns out that uh, uh, that you cannot do approximations such as DMFT. This is horrible. So non-causality means that your response functions are non-causal. means that the uh, imaginary part of self-energy, for example, is not uh, negative, but it becomes positive at some point in frequency. And uh, <laughs> that, of course, you have an infinite frequency. So it, uh, once you have non-causal equations, that will happen very quickly. So and then everything breaks down. So you want to have causal equations. <coughs> and um, now what's the requirement for that? Well. This is one way to write the self consistent condition, the EMT self consistent condition. So, this is G impurity, the impurity self uh, Green's function, which by definition has this form i omega minus sigma minus delta. This delta is, uh, is basically something which is called impurity hybridization. But that's the definition for the impurity Green's function. And here, this we recognize as our Green's function, the full Green's function, isn't it? Which has nabla square, external potential, hard exchange correlation, and so on. Okay? That's all these terms. Then we project it to get the local Green's function. And this G local has to be the same as G impurity, isn't it? That's one way of writing DMFT circumstances condition. And now what we need to make sure is that when self energy uh, goes to infinity, even when it goes to, it, this has to be valid for any self energy. Even when self energy goes to infinity, even when it has a pole. Having a pole in self energy uh, signals more transition. Okay? That's the point when the system goes through a mode transition. Self energy diverges. It has to be non perturbative, isn't it? It has to go through a mode transition. And even in this case, these equations shouldn't, be, shouldn't break down. Okay? So, for example, you send sigma to minus i infinity, it turns out that then the left and the right hand side have to cancel. Okay? Have to cancel. Which means that this delta has to become finite. Okay? And what's the requirement then? Well, we see here that we need to have something sigma inverse, isn't it? Has to be the same as you first project sigma into, uh, uh, no, first you embed. You embed sigma, then you inverse, inverse the whole thing, and then you project back. So see you, here you embed first, and then you inverse, and then you project, okay? This thing has to be, has to be satisfied, which is uh, symbolically here written as one over embedding times projector has to be identity, okay? So that's somewhat non-trivial, actually, that uh, many approximations don't satisfy that. What is easy to show, is that if you can write projector in a separable way, so like a product of two functions or a product of separable functions, so if it's separable, then this is satisfied trivially. Okay? So for a separable projection, no problem with causality for sure, that we know. Okay? But if the projector is not separable, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily non-causal. As I said, there is, a, there, is a, there is an example of DCA, which actually it's still causal and, uh, and projection is non-separable. <clears throat> We need to, if, if one comes up with a projector that's, that's 
uh, non-separable, one needs to check causality. It's absolutely, absolutely essential. Otherwise, uh, the approximation is horrible. Yeah, or you could think of it as an orbital. Are very long, and alpha and beta are just five, five times five, right? So I think mass is being a rectangular matrix, if I want. But then you write on the right hand side uh, two operators. So this operator are in what basis? I see the. Oh, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. It's alpha and R. Okay, okay, I get it. You get it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, the other thing which is usually, uh, uh, which is usually, in most approximations actually is not done well, and it's usually a problem, is that in our, uh, in our, in our derivation, we assumed that projector does not depend on the Green's function itself, okay? If it depends on the Green's function itself, there is a problem, you will see why. Well, <clears throat> we return back to our definition for the local Green's function. So we take your full Green's function, we apply projection to get the local Green's function. And then when we derive the stationarity, what did we do? Well, we took the phi d with t and we took the derivative with respect to g. And the way you do that is we take derivative of phi with respect to g local times derivative of g local with respect to g. That's what we did, isn't it? And then we said, okay, this derivative of g local with respect to g, we just, I look at this definition here, isn't it? And I can take the derivative of g local with respect to g, which gives me p. That's what we did, isn't it? Relatively straightforward. However, notice that we assumed here that p here does not depend on the Green's function itself, okay? Because if it did, there are extra terms. And then if there are extra terms, actually it's not so easy to add them because you might think that, well, I add extra terms. Well, then you have the problem of, uh, satis uh, you have to satisfy the projector times embedding is identity and, and so on. So it's very hard to satisfy. So the best, the best thing to do is actually to choose projector not to depend explicitly on the Green's function. Okay? Because if it depends on the explicitly on the Green's function, you can still do DMFT, but then your solution is not stationary. What does it mean that your solution is not stationary? It's not a stationary, solu it's not a stationary solution of your functional, which means that you, you change the whole scheme a little bit and you get different solution. You change the, you, you approximate something, you make a little approximation somewhere in your numerics, and it gives you quite different total energy. Okay? You don't want that. You want to be in a stationary point, because then small error in the Green's function, we, you know that it will give you very small error in your solution, because delta, uh, f uh, delta gamma or delta G is zero, okay? So small error cancels. And that, that's absolutely essential for all first principle methods. DFT is, is known to be stationary, yes? Uh, does this mean that if you do DFT plus DMT, you're not supposed to well, what it means, for example, you take one of your orbitals, a typical thing that, 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 that you can do more, most of the time, then, well, you see, you, you, this, uh, this low energy degrees of freedom depends explicitly on your psi, which depends explicitly on the density, which expresses explicitly on the Green's function, right. and therefore it generates this thing to be non-stationary. So yeah, it's, uh, if you take one of your functions like that, it's definitely bad. Now, if you take the LDS plus U projector, LDS plus U projector is just YLM, delta of Harman's prime YLM, okay? This one does not depend explicitly on the Green's function, doesn't it? But the radio function still does. Yeah, but I mean, my projector has delta of Harman's prime. I mean, then I, then, 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 then I apply this projector on my Green's function, and of course the radial function enter and so on. But my projector is this. This is what you use in the LDS plus U. I mean, 99% of the codes use this as a projector, delta function of R minus R prime, okay? Of course, then you write this usually, your equations are written <coughs> explicitly with the projector, and then it looks like the radio function enters, but that's the projector. That's the projector. No, radio function enters once you explicitly write this for your, uh, for your particular implementation. But this is, the, this is the real projector, only the projector, okay? Think about it, I'm sure that's the case. So the projector is definitely independent of your Green's function, okay? Just the product of YLMs. So now, unfortunately, this, unfortunately, this thing 
doesn't lead to causal DMT equations. Because this thing, you can verify that 1 over e times p is not identity and leads to non-causality. Explicitly checked, actually, it's non-causal. So unfortunately, this projector is also not good. So well, what is actually being used, at least in my code and in several other codes, is, is the following. So you write your projector in terms of spherical wave, YLMs, okay, times some radial wave function. Radial wave function. And this radial wave function is, for example, solution of the Dirac equation at the Fermi level. Okay? Why at the Fermi level? Because you want to have a reasonable solution at the Fermi level. Okay? So that, that's a reasonable choice. Now, however, as you pointed out very, very carefully, you should not update this mm -hmm. when you change the DMFT, when you add the DMFT Green's function. This should not be updated. Because once it's being updated, then, uh, then uh, you're basically violating the stationarity. Right. So it has to be fixed. Typically, what we do is we fix it on the LDA level. So we calculate your, your uh, wave function, your R of L, on the LDA level. And then that's your defines your projector. And then you don't touch the projector. Okay. So you mean you fix it at the very beginning of the subconsistent Well, that's, what, that's one way, yeah, uh -huh. for yeah, example. So the LDA level, first you do LDA, which shall consistency, mm -hmm. you fix it, mm -hmm. then you do the LDA at part DMT, yes. with these things. For example. Right. That, actually, it turns out that these radial functions don't change much. I mean, the, it, not only the radial function don't change much, even the density doesn't change much. It's very interesting, actually, that the LDA density is very, very good. Very, very good. It's just that the LDA spectral function is not good. It's a scale. Yeah, I mean, the, the density does not change, basically. So the fact that you said this on LDA, that's uh, barely noticeable in, the, in practice. So that's really not a problem. OK, so uh, a few more minutes on impurity solvers. So <coughs> uh, impurity solver is just a trick, as I said before, to compute this sum of all local diagrams. So this part here is just nuisance that comes with the impurity problem. Okay. The only thing that we really care about is this phi functional here. Um, and now the, the method of choice uh, is so-called uh, continuous time quantum Monte Carlo with Hubbardization expansion. It turns out that this is far the best for this kind of problems. Why? Well, because we don't, uh, we don't expand this. Uh, we don't expand in terms of Coulomb interaction but in terms of hybridization, which is much smaller scale. So it turns out that the Coulomb interaction is always a large scale. You don't want to perturb in terms of Coulomb repulsion, because that's usually, uh, it doesn't convert quick. Okay? But you want to perturb on something that's small parameter. And small parameter here is hybridization. In terms of this, this method is very, very efficient. So <clears throat> what you do is the following. You write your exact action. Well, uh, this is action. Uh, and this is, this is the partition function. This is the exact action for the impurity. Okay? So what does it consist of? Well, it has the action of the atom. I didn't even write it out how, how it looks like. But you can imagine how it looks like. It has some, some level, some, some, some energy levels. And it has some uh, Coulomb interaction and so on. So it's somewhat complicated. I didn't write it out explicitly. It has lots of degrees of freedom. And then in addition, there is this term which describes the bath, the infinite bath. Well, the, 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 it, it describes how the, the, this psi dagger here stands for the local degrees of freedom, OK? For the local degrees of freedom. So the electron can hop out of the impurity and can come back. This is retarded. Why? Because the electron hops out and after some time comes back, OK? Therefore, it looks like a retarded thing, OK? Retarded hopping. This is hybridization, OK? That's how the, how, how, this is one way of writing quantum purity model, OK? I'm not derived this, but. This is a standard way of writing quantum impurity model. Okay. Uh, now, what the CTKMC does is the following. It expands this, this Z in terms, of, in terms of this term, hybridization. Okay. Why? Because it turns out that this term, this delta, is much smaller parameter than u. Usually, Coulomb interaction is actually not small. This is a big number. Okay. But this delta in F systems is of the order of 4.1 eV. It's a small number. Okay? Now, in the D systems, close to the oxygen, for example, it can be of the order of eV or 2 eV. But still, it's much smaller than U, which is of the order of 10 eV. So it's, this, this delta is always a small scale compared to others. Okay? Therefore, the expansion is pretty, pretty good. Moreover, 
the point is here with this expansion, we can treat atom exactly. Okay? All the multiplets are treated exactly, so which is very important. Okay? So now how does this system work? Well, we, uh, we, de we write the power expansion in terms of delta to the arbitrary order. So this k is the order in which we power expand, isn't it? And because this bath is non-interacting, it turns out we can group k factorial terms into the determinant. Okay? We can, we, we can see it very quickly that if you write it out, k factorial terms can be grouped into the determinant, as always for non-interacting problems. And then uh, this represents a Feynman diagram. Okay? If in so -called, this is Feynman diagram in so-called strong coupling expansion. Okay? And this can be treated very, very efficiently with, with metropolis sampling, it turns out. Okay? And in most of the single side problems, there is very weak sign problem or even non-existing sign problem. Okay? That's very important for fermions, that the sign problem is very weak. Okay? So this actually turns out to be very efficient. Now, this is a typical perturbation order uh, in a actually complicated multiferroic. This is iron 2, molybdenum 3, oxygen 8, some multiferroic at 50 Kelvin. And you can see perturbation order for one side, one iron side is like uh, 450, and for another one, 650. So it's still, there are still large perturbation orders. Actually, it turns out perturbation order is, a, is a kinetic energy divided by temperature. So when temperature goes to zero, perturbation order goes to infinity. Okay? So you can never access zero temperature with this method. There's no way. However, reasonable temperatures, 50 Kelvin, are still reasonable. I mean, this is the perturbation order of the order of a few hundred. Okay? Now, of course, that's not, not something that you can work out on a piece of paper, isn't it? Perturbation order of the order of a few hundred, which means that it sums trillions of diagrams. Okay? So Monte Carlo sums trillions of diagrams. So it's still a huge thing. So it sums up 500 factorial diagrams. Huge, huge. But uh, nevertheless, Metropolis, it's, it's unbelievably efficient when it comes to that. So uh, this, this, this can be done within a, uh, an hour or so. Not a big deal. OK, now there are lots of technical developments <coughs> going on uh, very recently. So this is one paper from 2014. There are many others. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to go through these technical details, how CTKMC is uh, being optimized and improved. But <coughs> the message that I want to give here is that uh, these impurity solvers have, been, have seen tremendous improvements in the last five years or so. So there was a lot of development. And if hopefully this persists, we're going to be able to treat bigger and bigger and better uh, the, the problem for the solid. So that actually helps, helps a lot. Now, in the last five minutes, I want to discuss this, this double counting problem. Okay? So <clears throat> we discussed all the other terms, LDA part, the DMFT part, which is the sum of all skeleton diagrams. And now this last part, I said is DMFT approximation for the LDA functional or LDA approximation for a DMFT functional. What, what the hell that is? So, uh, well, let's look at it. Uh, you take the heart return. The heart return can be always explicitly written down. There's no problem, isn't it? Uh, LDA exchange correlation part can also be explicitly written down. We know the functional. Okay. Well, this is an approximation from the electron gas, but we know it. It's a 1D, 1D function. Okay. Um, and the, in the DMFT, we also know the functional. We already discussed many, many times. It's the sum of all skeleton diagrams. Okay. So in the DMFT, if we, if we want to, well, the, the, the DMFT functional has exactly the same form as the exact functional, except that the Green's function is truncated to the local level, so G becomes G local, and the Coulomb interaction has to be screened in a solid. So in a molecule that we discussed before, there was no screening, so we didn't, we didn't change Coulomb propulsion. But here we do need to change the Coulomb propulsion because we need to <coughs> discuss the screened Coulomb interaction. Okay? But that's how you, how you go in DMFT. In DMFT, in order to go from exact theory to DMFT theory, you replace in this, in this expansion, in this functional, G with G local, Coulomb propulsion with the screen Coulomb propulsion. And that's it. Okay? In LDA, what you do is you replace the exact exchange correlation with this parameterization that is taken from, heart, from, from electron gas problem. Okay? Now, uh, then... How do we determine double, uh, heart return, double counting of the heart return? Okay, what's being double counted on the heart level? Well, we take the exact heart return, it's the exact heart return, and we look at the DMFT approximation for the heart return. What is the DMFT approximation for the heart return? Well, as I said, the, 
the, the, here, uh, the, the Green's function is actually just the density that enters. So we need to approximate density with the local density. So it's P rho that enters instead of rho. Okay? And the Coulomb propulsion has to be screened, which is instead of VC, we are writing VC lambda. So the screened Coulomb propulsion. That's the, that's the DMT approximation for the Hartree term. And since in the, in the original functional, we already have the full Hartree term, we should subtract from the DMFT the Hartree term, the DMFT Hartree term. He has to subtract out, subtract it out, because otherwise it's treated, it enters twice, doesn't it? So that, therefore, this term contributes to the double counting on the Hartree level, okay? So this term, where it looks exactly like Hartree, except that, that the rho is projected and Coulomb proportion is screened, has to be subtracted out, okay? Now, one can work out the exchange part in a similar way. I'm not going to go through it because I don't have time. But <clears throat> uh, one can think of the, all the other terms, like exchange and correlation together. What do we need to do? Well, in LDA, what we do is we map the electron gas problem to, to uh, uh, we map this, the problem to an electron gas problem point by point, and we write the electron uh, gas problem is this, uh, is this integral of the exchange correlation of unscreened Coulomb interaction over the full space. That's, what, that's the approximation we, we do in LDA. In DMFT, we take the exact functional here, but we replace G by G local and Coulomb version by the screen Coulomb version. Now, in order to get the double counting, we need to apply both approximations simultaneously. So, which means that we apply DMFT approximation on the LDA problem. So by applying DMFT approximation on the LDA problem means that this row here becomes row local. And this cool propulsion becomes screen cool propulsion. And that's the expression. Okay? We can also think of applying LDA approximation on a DMT functional. So what would LDA do if we had a functional like that? Well, it would take your, G, your local density, your screen cool propulsion, and it would map point by point to an uh, electron gas problem. Okay? And if it does that, well, it gets also this thing. Okay? So in both cases, no matter how you go, you get this is being treated both in LDA and in DMFT. So this is the double counting. This, this is what you need to subtract. And once you do that, uh, you, are, uh, uh, you, you, have, you have your approximation. Now, the Coulomb interaction <coughs> is something that I'm going to have two minutes to talk about. Um, now, the Coulomb interaction has to be screened in solid. So it means that it has to have Yukawa type of form, something like that, isn't it? So between the, the degrees of freedom that we keep in DMFT. Now, once we define the DMFT projector P, for example, this is, this, this is a concrete suggestion for the projector. We can also apply this projection to our U, and we get the Coulomb interaction between our local degrees of freedom. But of course, it needs to be screened. So it needs to have finite, finite screening lambda, of course. Okay. Uh, well, of course, one way is to write this uh, typically, we then expand this function in terms of YLMs and some uh, radial function, for example. And then we can see that actually this Coulomb propulsion has a, a relatively simple form. It consists of something which is called Gaunt coefficients that have all the angle dependence, isn't it? It's the product of three YLMs, and something which we call Slater coefficients. And the Slater coefficients are the integrals over our, our, our radius, okay? integral radius. So in other words, at the end of the day, the Coulomb propulsion is usually parameterized in terms of a few Slater coefficients, fk, because this, these are just numbers that you can tabulate and we can calculate uh, once and forever. OK, now uh, the very last minute. Uh, the important point is that in DMFT, when you do DMFT, you have to, uh, the, screen, the, the U has to be screened only by the degrees of freedom that are not explicitly included in DMFT. That's very important. So in other words, if you include more degrees of freedom in your local problem, you have to screen less. Because you know, if, you, if, you, if you treat all the degrees of freedom, then there is no screening. So less the degrees of freedom you take, more screening you have to, you have, to have. Because the rest, whatever is being integrated out has to screen, doesn't it? So therefore, this U parameter, of course, depends on what is your projector, depends on what you treat you treat exactly. How big window you take? Big, bigger the window, bigger the U. 
And um, it turns out that in DMFT, actually, the, 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 the screening by hybridization is very, very efficient. The screening hybridization is so-called famous condo problem. Okay? Famous condo problem means you start with local, local impurity, and well, at low energy, it's completely screened out. That's the, that's the hybridization screening. So this is actually very efficient in DMFT, and therefore, typically, group interactions in DMFT are much, much larger than what you need in LDA plus U methods, which doesn't have that screening. Hybridization screening is not there because it's, it's a hard to fog approximation. So there are several ways of estimating the school propulsion roughly. It's extended DMFT equations, for example, constrained RPA, constrained LDA, and so on. Now, the, the take home message that I want to give for the very, very last slide is unfortunately, these methods are not good enough. In my opinion, this is the hurdle right now in completely ab initio theory of LDA plus DMFT. This is really the hurdle. Why? Because we are not able to have a consistent theory that would give, in let's say, very different materials, a good approximation for cooler propulsion. So for example, many people believe that constrained RPA works really well in these systems. Well, but if you apply it to an Cerium, an F system, it gives six times wrong Coulomb propulsion, which is really bad. So uh, there are other theories which, which work better in F systems, but worse in D systems. So there is no, I think currently, we don't have a good theory of estimating the Coulomb propulsions ab initio. So with this, I would like to conclude. No, because this is the, way you, the way you think of this in real space is that systematic improvements would be increasing the size in real space rather than in energy space. I don't want to truncate first in energy space and have something that's very long range in real space. I want to truncate in real space, just like density functional theory. You know, it truncates in real space. It doesn't start to truncate in some energy space. Okay? So that's, that's how I think about it. And the reason for this is purely because DMFT is a local approximation. Being local approximation means that all your interactions are truncated to local degrees of freedom only. And therefore, if you have something that is, is downfolded to a very small window, it will generate very long range Coulomb propulsions. And these cannot be treated in DMFT. I mean, the cluster extensions, yes, but not in DMFT. So we throw them away. And therefore, your DMFT approximation is, is very miserable approximation in these downfall and models. So therefore, I'm not happy about them. I mean, but it's it's wallet way of doing it. It's just more more approximate, I would say. Well, I wouldn't completely agree with that, because the point is that the hybridization is determined itself consistently. But in DFT, we know, I mean, it, 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 it's not a... Well, it's a, it's a well-known example of cerium, for example. It turns out that hybridization of, on LDA, LDA level on cerium is factor of two wrong. Okay? And for a long time, when people were trying to match the, the impurity problem with the, uh, with, with, the quant with solution of quantum impurity, it didn't work out. It was a disaster. Factor of two wrong hybridization, that's... Several orders of magnitude wrong on the scale. But it turns out when you do it self consistently, it's actually reduced. This is so called condo extinction uh, phenomena. And it turns out it gives you a reasonable scale. Right, but you're talking about self consistent orbital, not a orbital, right? No, no, I'm talking about the hybridization. So the hybridization between the correlated orbital and the rest of the system is corrected through a self consistent I agree. condition. But what I'm saying, what I'm saying before is if you start with just DMT. Mm -hmm. When I'm using the word hybridization, I'm talking about hybridization of a local orbital and a neighboring atom. Mm -hmm. That's hybridization is going to be determined. If at the LDA level, if we know that's going to be wrong, 
then if you downfold and incorporate those other extended orbitals into your localized object, you're starting with an object that is locked. I agree with that. that, that that's my point. I agree with that. Was Very important. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. Yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah, uh, to follow up this discussion, isn't it true that, uh, as you say, you want the interaction to be local, and the nature way to do that is to go to very high energy to start with, right? Correct. But isn't it almost automatically telling us that DOT is an excellent approximation of high energy physics, but become more and more problematic when you go try to describe very low energy physics? I agree with you. I agree with you because the, the nature tells you when you go to very low low uh, energies, everything is very non-local. Right. So the Q is equal to zero becomes so important when you go to very low energies, and right. therefore the low energy models usually t take the, the Q is equal to zero limit, doesn't that? Why? Because well, <clears throat> long wavelength is the only thing that is important in a low energy theory. But if you go to the high energy theory, then things are local. Right. This local approximation is ex excellent. We know that, and therefore. The MFT is, is local, so it's a natural thing to choose, to choose local degrees of freedom mm -hmm. rather than something thinner. Yes? So in, uh, at low energy and on long uh, uh, length scales, uh, fluctuations are often very important. So if you map everything on the cohen uh, sham equations, so the better shared energy. But cohen uh, sham equations, are they in some sense linked to the equations? I, I didn't actually do cohen sham equations at all. If you noticed, I, I had only Dyson equation at the end of the day. That's an equation is not Kronstrom equation anymore. So all these objects actually, this this size actually become frequency dependent. Okay, so I'm not, I don't have Kronstrom equations at the end of the day. There are generalized Kronstrom equations actually, or if you want to think about it. The point is, the only thing that I have is the Dyson equation. The Dyson equation is, well, exact. But you still don't have low energy fluctuation, right? It's a mean field. You have a mean field. All low energy fluctuations have thrown up. You only have partition locals, right? Correct. Correct. <laughs> I guess we should call it a day. And